Good afternoon, everyone. This is Queenie Clem with Queenie's Book Talk and Reviews, and I am your literary ambassador. And today I have Arthur J.J. Wilson on my channel today. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, thank you. My How last you? name is Weston, like the cigarettes. So All you guys right. remember that. I always say, it's actually, my name is Judy Jackson Winston. So I be like Judy with the Y, Jackson like Jesse, Winston like the cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. And happy, happy birthday. Thank you. That's right. Today's my V day. <laughs> yes. Now tell us a little about yourself. Well, you know, I am a social worker as well as an attorney. So for many years, you know, I've worked in social work here in Cleveland, Ohio. For 19 years, I worked at the Cuyahoga Alcohol, Drug, and Mental Health Board, um, where I was the client rights advocate. So I came up with the ideas for my book because particularly in the African-American community, I see a lot of stigma and respect to people getting mental health treatment. So I wanted to, you know, write something to help to motivate people to understand that mental health is healthcare too. And I also wanna help eradicate stigma, not just for African-American people, but for people in general, but in particular for the black community. Okay. Now, what are behavior health disorders? Well, some of the most common disorders are post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a pretty common one, anxiety, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder. So it's, we call them diseases of mind, mood, and personality. What does it look like and how do we cope with it? Well, you know, it depends. Mental health can manifest itself in many ways. Um, in my novels, I tried to touch on a lot of different type of issues. My main character in the anniversary had bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. um, in my newest book, The Commemoration, one of my um, characters has post-traumatic stress disorder. I think post-traumatic stress disorder is pretty common, particularly, you know, a lot of us have dealt with trauma. Mm -hmm. We may not have even realized that it was trauma. But in my second book, I even also wanted to go further with trying to educate my readership, by also teaching people about sickle cell disease as well as human trafficking. Okay. Now let's talk about your books. Tell me right. each one of them. Show me a copy of them. And you show you both. These are my two novels. Mm -hmm. One is the anniversary. The other one is the commemoration. Mm -hmm. My book, the anniversary one, was a finalist for the Independent Author Network's um, 2020 Book of the Year in Outstanding Women's Literary Fiction. So oh, I'm very wow. proud of that. And um, yeah, I'm trying to do something with you know my work. Mm -hmm. I feel this is my purpose, you know, to try to educate. So I might have went past the question. I'm sorry, Queenie. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and tell us <laughs> about your girl. Books. <laughs> Just tell Bring us about back, your girl. book. Just tell us about your books. Well, you know, my books, my books, uh, particularly, you know, my book, The Anniversary. What I want people to understand is that my characters are dealing with an uh, anniversary. And when we think about anniversaries, we often think about things like, you know, good stuff. We don't ever necessarily think about bad things, but mm -hmm. I'll give an example of an anniversary that when we think about it, we go, wow, 9-11. Every year now we, we celebrate 9-11, but that's an anniversary of something that is, you know, bad to happen collectively to the country. Yes. And, you know, but a lot of people are dealing with things individually that are anniversaries that only they know about, yeah, right. you know, when you lose somebody or whatever. And, you know, and that's what my book is about. And it's about, you know, my character not adequately dealing mm -hmm. with mental health issues and that, you know, trauma, it costs its whole family. So, and a lot of times I think we're not wanting to deal with these subjects because, you know, it's a lot of stigma. People think you're stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been taught in the African-American community, not to talk about these things, that we're strong, that we survived um, slavery, we could survive anything. And what we need to understand as a community is that 
what we were taught is not necessarily wrong. Like we were told not to go and be telling people all our business because at one time when you went and you told the social workers these things, they came and they took your kids. Yes. So we taught our people, shut up. Don't be telling people stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. But what we also have done is we have told people that it's not okay to talk and to tell people what's going on. And if you just keep pushing something down, sooner or later, it's going to come up and it might come out badly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it's just about us. I'm just trying to do something to help us foster communication. Okay, tell us about your second book. My second book is a sequel to my first book. Okay. and um, But my characters are also dealing with human trafficking because in Ohio, or, you know, I want to help to educate, you know, my readership, that human trafficking is a really big deal. We have a lot of uh, people being taken What I want people to understand is that human trafficking, it's not just sex trafficking. There's other forms of human trafficking. You know, when I worked at the Adams board, I had a client that was a victim of human trafficking. And, you know, he was forced to cook Chinese food like 14 hours a day. He was from China. Mm -hmm. He was bought here. He didn't speak the language. Basically, they just put him in a Chinese restaurant and made him cook all day. You know, he was a human trafficking victim. No, he wasn't being forced to have sex, but yes, he was being forced into labor. And what I want people to understand is that human trafficking is slavery. And this is modern day slavery and it's still happening right now. And in Ohio, we're a very high up as a state with a high number of human trafficking uh, because of the numbers of ways to get in and out of our state and how close we are to Canada. Yeah. So I just want to help to bring that awareness. And then I just want to, you know, also bring awareness about sickle cell disease. My daughter has sickle cell disease. My father passed away from sickle cell disease. And I have a number of relatives who passed away from it or who have it. And I just feel that if I'm going to raise awareness, I need to be raising awareness about things that are also important to my family and our life. And I actually know an awful lot about it, you know, being a parent that has a child with this. So I'm just trying to do my part in the universe, Clint Queenie. Okay. Now, how, uh, when writing these books, what type of research or where did you get your research from? Well, you know, the anniversary was a short story I wrote years ago. And I let um, someone who was a professional writer read it and she loved it. And she told me that it was really good and that I should develop it into a novel. And so I did. And I have, I mean, I have a a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in social work, and I've spent 25 plus years working with people with mental illness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I know a lot about it because this is what I've been doing with my whole career. So I felt it was a good way to, you know, use my knowledge base. Right. They say write about what you know. So when I was in school, you know, I was like a really good writer. I was always in gifted and talented writing. And um, I'm just going to be honest. Sometimes I'm a, um, (laughs) I say, you know, I can drink my own Kool-Aid because I'm like, if they can write a book, I can write a book. Yeah. So I love to read. When I read all these books, I said, I can do that. (laughs) (laughs) And I did it. It's hard, though. It's harder than I thought it was. It's a good challenge. Yes. It, look, being an egomaniac has its perks. <laughs> and that means, you know what? You can do what you say you can do. Yes. <laughs> you yes. really believe it. <laughs> now, can you share a snippet from one of your books? Well, you know what? I think it's important. Um, I'm going to read from, from the, I'll read like the prologue a little bit. So it's not real long. Mm-hmm. from the anniversary so you can kind of get an idea of you know what we're talking about Man. okay so <laughs> I gotta put on my speaking voice <laughs> <laughs> what's happening to me who are you what do you want I don't believe you mama wouldn't do that she wouldn't lie to me Granville found himself in the bathroom with the door closed while looking in the mirror, talking to himself. He realized that he was speaking aloud again, and it scared him because Juliet could have been listening. 
He couldn't tell her he was hearing voices inside his head, which were telling him lies about his mother. Juliet wouldn't believe him. No one would believe him. When it first happened, he fought back and wrestled with the voices, and they eventually left him alone. However, they began to come and go whenever they wanted. It was becoming harder and harder to make them stop telling him things he did not want to hear or believe. I can't think straight anymore, he mumbled. I need to tell somebody about this, but who can I tell? Greta is going through the same issues I am since mom's death. I don't want to burden her. I have to talk to Franklin, but he's my business partner. I can't. I have to keep my personal life out of the office. He may understand, but I can't talk to him about this. He may try to break our partnership, the voices said. Why did you say that? Franklin would never do a thing like that to me. We're best friends, Granville answered. Well, you know what mother said, don't you? Keep it all to yourself and don't tell nobody, the voices said. Granville peeked out of the door to make sure Juliet was not in the bathroom. He tiptoed across the room and stretched across the bed, feeling exhausted. He could not believe what just happened again. He looked up at the ceiling, closed his eyes until the voices disappeared. So that's the problem. <laughs> oh, I like that. I got my copy. I'm going to be reading that. Yes. And thank you. I love how you, uh, the package that you sent me last week. I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, what inspired you to write this particular topic about this particular topic? Well, I'm a behavioral health, you know, pretty, pretty much, I would say I'm an expert in the state of Ohio, probably. You know, all these years that I did this, I was the person, so just to, so you understand what my job was, is I was like internal affairs of behavioral health. So if somebody had a grievance with their mental health agency or their drug or alcohol agency, I would represent them because I'm also on a term. So I would make sure that the agencies and the group homes and the apartment buildings where our constituency lived, that they followed the rules. They didn't just throw our clients out of treatment or take advantage of them. I also investigated abuse and neglect. So, you know, if somebody, if our workers slept with our clients or beat our clients or stole their money, I was the person who investigated. So I got a chance to work with all kinds of people mm -hmm. and all kinds of disorders, all kinds of illnesses. So, I, you know, what I did know throughout my whole um, time as a professional doing this is that there are a lot of professional people who are dealing with mental illness, but they don't want anybody to know. Mm -hmm. So what I did was make my characters professionals, both my characters are attorneys. You know, this happens, you know, to 25% of the population. People need to understand this is a very common, you know, disease. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't strike people based on their race or their gender or their socioeconomic statuses or their religion. It, it clearly goes across the board. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is to, to make people feel as though they have a safe space so that we can talk about this, you know, and so that we can help people. You know, it, I remember working with a, a young lady who had a daughter that was schizophrenic, her only child. And so she said when she was married to her husband, she kept asking him where his mother was. And he always told her his mother was dead. But his mother wasn't dead. His mother was as actually in an institution because she has severe mental illness. This woman was really, really angry about this. You know, mm -hmm. you know, really what you should do is be honest and then let people make a decision on if they want to mix their DNA up with you. You know, and that's not just about mental illness. That's about any type of disorder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to be having more of these conversations and also understanding that people who have mental illness are people too, and they, they can have a productive life. They can, there are a lot of people are brilliant, particularly people who have bipolar disorder. We used to like to say, we call it the CEO disease because more people with bipolar disorder are CEOs in the United States because their thinking is outside the box. Mm -hmm. 
But what we need to do sometimes is give people those tools and that support system. So if we make it okay where, you know, this is a part of life. It's like having a diabetes or high blood pressure. We don't tell people if they got that, don't talk about it. Or heart disease or any other disease. So I just really wanted to try to make it something that we can, you know, just have a discussion about and not have a stigma associated and attached. Mm -hmm. What do you do when you're not writing? Uh, I love to watch television. I love to watch movies. I love music. And actually, I love to fish. Really? Now, don't get me wrong. I love to fish, but I leave my husband to put the hook, yep, that's <laughs> the worm it. on the hook. And then after I catch the fish, take the fish off the hook. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is your role in the writing community? Um, I'm hoping I, that people consider me as a leader in the writer community. I think they do. Um, but, you know, this is, I mean, I consider it to be a job, but I'm also a magistrate judge. So I work in family court. Mm -hmm. That's what I do now. I left the Adams board four years ago and became a magistrate. So I just think that, you know, you know, particularly as an African-American writer, I think it's important that we uplift our communities with stories about us. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a problem telling the story about us and about us learning from our stories and understanding our rich storytelling, you know, background. That's how we've been able to survive. We know a lot about, you know, our history because of our ability to storytell. Yes. So I think that that's important. So I think I'm a leader. You got to ask other people. They think I'm a leader too, though. Okay. <laughs> How did you choose the genre that you're writing in? You know, I, I love to read. And so some of my favorite authors like Omar Tyree, Jay California Cooper, um, uh, what's the guy that passed away? Elan Harris. Um, the, uh, I mean, that's my other favorite person. He just passed away too. I'm having a, a moment. But I just love to read. And so, I, and, and you know, and Terry McMillan, I loved all her books. I could just go on and on, you know, just books that I just really enjoy. And um, I think that uh, women's literature is a really good genre for me. I don't care if guys read my book. You can learn something too, gentlemen. Yes, <laughs> okay. yes. Uh, when you said Omar Tyree, I just talked to him Friday night on the phone. <laughs> really? He is, I just yes. love his books. He is awesome too. Yes, yes. And I just bought Terry McMillan's the her last, her latest one. So yes, I, she is awesome. Yes. Too. I saw her here in Cleveland. And then you know, um, I don't know if you knew who Doris uh Dolores Phillips, the darkest child. Yes, yes. From Cleveland. And so when I did have a book, she passed away though. Yes, when I had a yes. book club, she actually came to my book club, which made my day. So I just love to read. And I feel, and like I told you, being an egomaniac is actually not a bad thing sometimes. I was like, if all those people can do it, I can do it too. Mm -hmm. But what's important is when you are self published, which I am, you have to have a team. You have to have a team of editors. You have to have a team. So I'm just going to hold up my book covers again. The, the book covers are actual pieces of art that are in my house. Oh. Um, there's a gentleman. He runs our methadone clinic here in Cleveland. His name is L.C. Collins. He actually, these are actual pictures he did for me to be my book covers. And he actually created the piece of art for me. I love art. I suck at art. The only thing I can do is draw a stick figure. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I love art. What did you learn when writing your books? You know, I learned that you, first off, you have to be flexible. You have to be, I learned to, um, you know, to, to always listen to other people's advice without changing what you're trying to do. So like when I originally wrote the anniversary, uh, the first editor I had was like, it's an excellent book, but the order was wrong. And she changed the order around and it actually made the book so much better. You know, um, she did a really good, good job with the, uh, that kind of stuff, you know, moving things around, but there were some problems, you know, with the kind of mistakes that I had in my book. And I was, you know, I want everything to be perfect. 
Mm-hmm. So now I wind up getting a second editing team, um, Erica Parker, who is over Lyrical Innovations. Um, her and her team, uh, they really did a good job editing both my books and, you know, making sure everything is perfect, flawless. I don't like mistakes. You only really get that one chance, you know, chance mm-hmm. to try to make everything right. And I, you know, I just think that that's what you have to do is you have to just put the time and you have to put the money into it too. People need to understand there's a financial consideration to this. You hope you get your money back, but you might not. Mm-hmm. It's a gamble, just like life is. Yes, yes. What was the hardest part about writing your books? This, you know, the hardest part about writing the second book is remembering everything that's in the first book. So that's just consistent. Because there is nothing worse than reading a book. Because, you know, like I remember reading um, uh, Sister Soldier. You know, one of my favorite books was The Coldest Winter Ever. And then I went and read her sequel. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Some of this stuff ain't matching. You know what I'm saying? People don't like that. So that's, I think, the hardest thing about it was going back and just trying to um, make sure everything was consistent. With the first book, the first book was probably like 800 pages. Wow. <laughs> And I had to cut quite a bit of it. You know, my original people who put my first book together wanted me to make it, put it in, split it in half, and I refused. Mm-hmm. I, you know, but people still was like, you left us hanging, but you still did get more than what you would have gotten. Right. <laughs> had I taken their advice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. What do you enjoy most about writing? You know, I have really a stressful job, so I feel that writing is a good way for me to escape. Like, I almost become those characters when I'm writing them. And um, it's really just a, one of the things I really enjoy. It's a good way to entertain myself, in particular in the middle of a pandemic where you ain't got nothing but time on your hands. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to, you know, be productive with my time and when the pandemic is over, be able to look back on what I've been able to accomplish during this time so what is the biggest thing that people think that you know about this topic but don't i don't know how it feels to be a person with mental illness however i believe that i can really identify with this situation why because i have a daughter that has sickle cell disease another disease that is inherited, okay? You never know when the symptoms are gonna come on, they just come, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that that's what's made me a really good advocate. When I first became, you know, got in the field or became the advocate for mental health, I did get some pushback from some people who were mentally ill that felt that I couldn't actually do a good job representing them because I didn't live their situation. Mm -hmm. But what I made them understand is I don't have to live their exact situation to live their situation. You know what I'm saying? I know how it is to be a parent who has a child to have something going on that you can look fine. That's another thing with mental illness. You know, you can look at somebody, you can't see it. Right. There's some diseases you can look at somebody and you can see they have it. If they have some developmental dis- disabilities, I can look at you and see you have it. You know, you, you're blind. I can see that maybe. You're deaf. You know, I might be able to know that, but people who have these disorders, you know, you you can look at them, they look like everybody else. You can't see who has it. Yes. So I hope I answered that question. You did. (laughs) What is one, what is one important thing you want people to know about this topic? That we should never, ever be afraid to talk about it in particular now. You know, what's happening in this pandemic is you have way more people who are dealing with both mental health and drug and alcohol issues. Mm -hmm. People are feeling isolated. You know, I was speaking on another show maybe a week ago, two weeks ago, I was telling the host, you know, in Japan, they had more people die of suicide in just the month of October than everybody that's died of COVID. Did you know that? No. Mental illness and mental, not necessarily mental illness, but mental health issues are impacting everybody across the globe. It's an isolation issue. 
a lot of us are being forced to stay home. You know, we're not being able to interact with our loved ones and our friends. And what I suggest that people do is to communicate with each other, to connect with your family and friends. You don't always have to see people to connect. I'm a huge proponent of letter writing. Something you can do with your kids too. Sit down, help them write a letter. Older family members and friends love to get letters. Yes. When I was, I'm a, I mean, I'm trying to look good for my age girl giving this my birthday, but I'm from an age, you know, when I was a kid, we didn't have social media and we didn't have text messages. You know, your aunties, like, you know, my birthday when I was growing up, my aunt sent me a $5 check. <laughs> <laughs> And I always got it like either right before my birthday or on my birthday, $5. I knew no matter what, I was going to get $5. But I was look forward to getting that, that card in the mail with the little letter in it and stuff. Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of other people who feel that way too. So if you're feeling isolated, this is what I'm telling your you know, viewers. If any of you are feeling isolated, take advantage of this time. You know, reach out to your family members and your friends, call them, FaceTime them if they know technology. Understand old people like myself, I ain't got no um, iPhone. I don't know technology like that. I'm lucky I'm on this Zoom call, okay? <laughs> um, but take the time and if you have children, help them. This is a good way to help them learn how to, you know, write better. Mm -hmm. It's a good way to help them with their penmanship, which, you know, these are arts that are being lost in today's time. Yes. yes. So communicate. Mm -hmm. How can readers find you and your books? Well, they can always go on my website. My website is www.novelistjjwinston.com. You can always uh, follow me on Instagram. You can follow me on Facebook, again, at Novelist JJ Winston. So if you just remember the Novelist JJ Winston, you can find me. Okay. Okay. I'm everywhere. I'm trying to be. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else you would like to add before we close? Well, first off, I'd like to thank you for having me today. It's really an honor. And I'm hoping that people will, you know, read my book and do reviews for me. I do have a lot of really good reviews. Um, I would like more, you know, and I like support if I can get it. And if you need me to speak, because I can speak about these subjects, I have a whole Know Your Sales about Sickle Cell Awareness campaign I do. I do a lot of presentations on mental health. Just, you know, get in touch with us. You can call, you know, um, email me at info at novelist JJ Winston. And I'd be happy okay. to virtually come and speak to your group. Okay. Can you show your books one more time, please? I would love to show my books one more time. Well, let's have it backwards. <laughs> Thank you. You know what? And again, um, I just appreciate the support. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. That's the end of this. Her name is JJ Winston. She has two books. You can reach out to her to novelist JJ Wilson. Wilston? Yes, Winston. Yeah. And on Amazon too. Amazon, you can always hit me up on Amazon. <laughs> All right. Thank you for coming in today. And again, happy birthday. Thank you so much. You're welcome. This is Queenie Clem with Queenie's Book Talk and Reviews. Happy reading. Bye, y'all. Bye.